Yo, yo. Let's cook, eh? I think I'm going to make some fajitas and uh, chat and stuff. Hot chat. So, um, if you want, ask questions, whatever. Uh, let me see if I can get this to give you a little bit better view of what I'm doing here. Ah, it's hard to get that and me. Let me see if I can move this down this way. Um, still isn't doing it. Yeah, I, I liked it better in the first position there. So, sorry for the movement. Maybe I'll move this down this way. Maybe we can get it adjusted. Well, you can see a little bit of me, and I just got to cut up in this in this area. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do here is make some uh, pico de gallo. Um, for that, I need to get out some tomatoes. And you got to wash these tomatoes, otherwise you'll get the poops. Um, these are... Uh, I don't know, some greenhouse grown tomatoes, but if you don't wash them, you'll probably poop your guts out. Uh, hey, we have a watcher. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to do some cooking today and hopefully talk a few of you into subscribing to the other channel, the live streams channel. There's a link, well, just about everywhere you can find a link. Um, So I'm going to make fajitas, and before I cut up any meat, I'm going to do veggies um, because I want to make some pico de gallo. Nothing's better on that than uh, on some fajitas than some pico de gallo. So I'm going to I'm going to use about four tomatoes, I think. Wash them off real well so you don't get the poops. And then, uh, I can't find my favorite knife. Uh, somebody must have used it for something else. So, I guess I'm going to have to use this substitute here. Uh, so, anyway, for pico de gallo, what I do is um, I like to use pretty ripe tomatoes. Um, and I just kind of dice them up in kind of a rough dice um, and get rid of this center portion. Uh, actually, I need what I need to do is I need to focus, put this up here. So you see it's uh, kind of a rough dice there. Uh, yeah, you can see that. Kind of, uh, let me see. Nope, nope, nope. There you can see it. You can see this. Maybe I'll work down here. Okay. So, um, pico de gallo, making salsa if you're just joining, uh, and eventually some fajitas, and shooting the breeze. What do you guys want to talk about? Um, well, let's see, earlier today I made sauerkraut, and... Uh, I live streamed a whole bunch of it on Facebook and I threatened them that if they didn't subscribe to my AIG live streams channel that I was gonna, I was gonna put it up there 24 hours a day seven days a week <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny uh, and I got actually a whole bunch of them did subscribe so um, when you're making your pico I just dice up some tomatoes I'm gonna get out a bowl put these in uh, always wash them. Let's see. Put some of these in there. So I add tomatoes. So you're going to see a lot of the prep work. A lot of the times when I do these recipes, you just see like literally nothing. You just see the end result. Um, see. 
you get rid of the the green part in the center. Everything else you should eat. It's good for you. Eat your vegetables. Drink your milk. Hey, a whole bunch of viewers now. Hi, everyone. We're making uh, fajitas, and I'm starting with some pico de gallo. Pretty easy to make. Um, I just dice up, uh, well, for this amount, I'm going to, maybe I'll just do two tomatoes. That's probably enough, because my kids won't eat it anyway. I'll save the other two for another dish or something. There we go. Let's see. I think that's... Yeah, it'll go to waste otherwise. I'm just going to do the two tomatoes. If you have a question or a comment, let me know. Uh, this is Interactive Cooking. Live on the Average Iowa Guy YouTube channel. So I have some onion now, and I gotta I gotta peel it off and, and wash it. I'm not gonna use all of that. So for the amount of tomato that I have in there, that's probably too much onion. Um, for all these all these things you make, you gotta you gotta think about the balance of flavors. Um, I'm not making a huge batch of pico, I'm making kind of a, a small one because I only need enough for a few fajitas. My kids won't eat it. Sometimes they're buttheads. Uh, Eric Fab. Eric uh, Fabian says, so what inspired you to start creating all this live content? Well, I guess I would say that, um, number one, it's um, more dynamic. So you, you just asked a question in real time, and you're getting an answer right now. And it's to me, that kind of entertainment is far more entertaining. That's one of the reasons I like... Uh, um, video games and, and things like that. It's it's not static entertainment. You're actually interacting with the entertainment. So I'd say that's the biggest reason is just a, a philosophy of what I think is more entertaining. Um, another reason is uh, I think that pretty much you know in the future you're you're just not going to see a lot of. I mean. Who, who watching has a subscription to television? Like, I sure as hell don't. Um, and I haven't for a long time. And I think that the, the future of entertainment is going to involve uh, involve stuff where you can interact with them as they're doing it. Now, obviously, if there's if you're just getting bombarded with questions and stuff, it, it, makes, it makes it more difficult. But um, for the amount of people that that watch this and, and, uh, you know, comment and, and actually want to talk. It's right now it's manageable, but you know, try, try this on a, on a bigger thing and you're going to get all this crazy stuff going on. So, you know, I just kind of mix it up. My hands are very clean. No worries. I've washed them like 80 times today because I've been making sauerkraut all day. So this is, um, I've got, uh, tomatoes and onion. Uh, pay attention to balance when you're making this stuff. Um, let's see. Now, next thing I'm going to add is some serrano peppers. If I can find them. You know how that is when you're looking for something. There they are. So I'm going to add two serranos, but I have to wash them first. Um, there they are. I 
I guess I'd say the other thing that kind of got me interested in doing the live content is I found myself starting to enjoy it. Like, uh, and I, I'm, I'm much more likely to kick, click on something if it's somebody I know and they're live than I am uh, like a static video, unless I'm looking up like, you know, how to, how to do something, unless I'm looking up something highly technical, um, then, you know, I don't care static versus live. Actually, probably static is better because they're able to edit out stuff like this where they're chopping it up because really you don't need to see the chopping up part. Um, I just think that, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that I like to watch. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, again, this, this channel is uh, obviously you guys really enjoy it, but the reason I do this channel is because I enjoy doing it. And, um, you know, I, I'll put up a video, like if I figure out how to do something and there's not really a good video on the internet, I'll put up a video of how to do it so that I remember how I did it. And so that someday, um, you know, if my kids or their kids or whoever come along and want to uh, figure out you know, the family recipe for whatever, um, there's a video on how to do it. And don't worry, I won't touch anything important with with this hand now because it's been in uh, some hot peppers. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. Other questions? Anything else? Otherwise I'm just going to cook and we can yak. Uh, what, what I got here is I got a, a big bunch of cilantro and I'm going to go ahead and uh, do I think of myself as an entertainer? No. Um, not at all. I'm, I'm actually a surgeon, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I like to, uh, I mean, if you want your videos to be more entertaining, now see when I'm doing this, basically I have a, uh, I'm, I'm showing my kids or my ancestors someday how to make pico de gallo and then later how to make refried beans and all this and at the same so I'm, I'm putting up a video of something that I was going to do anyway and I'm not having to sit down and spend hours and hours editing it and in the meantime there's like uh, you know some interaction going on um, and you know if I if, if I knew somebody and they they were making something like this and I wondered what they were up to and how they were making it I'd probably watch it so, again, uh, the whole, whole point of this channel is, is I have to enjoy doing it. And it has to, I have to put up stuff that I would enjoy watching. Otherwise, I just, I just won't do it. So I like uh, my pico de gallo with a fair amount of uh, this sort of thing in there, this uh, cilantro. Um, you know, so that's got to be a, probably a good full tablespoon diced. That's probably enough. If you if you get it too too much, it'll burn it or not really burn it, but you you know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna wash off the cutting board. Let's see. So. Uh, lime. I need to add some lime juice. So here we have a lime. Um, to that amount of stuff, I'm going to add a whole lime. And you just, you just cut it in half and squeeze. There's nothing fancy you need to do there. Uh, you live in the Midwest, but have traveled a lot, right? Uh, how do these influences mix into your cooking? Well, <laughs> that's an easy one. Um, I'm standing looking at my 
cookbook shelf. It's about four feet wide and about seven feet tall, and it's literally overflowing with cookbooks from around the world. So um, anytime I go anywhere, what I like to do is I like to get a flavor of what uh, the locals are eating, um, and I always try to figure out how they're making it because, um, you know, if you look around on my channel, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Like um, I made uh, something called cook up rice with this guy in the middle of the jungle in Vienna. And then, you know, every time I go somewhere new, I'll find like a new twist on how to do something um, and uh, have a new dish that I can make. So from Vienna, I brought back uh, cook up rice, uh, Guyanese, so I'm going to put about a, about a teaspoon of salt in there. Uh, I brought, and maybe a little bit of black pepper, not a huge amount. I brought back uh, cook up rice, uh, a chicken curry that's green, and roti, R-O-T-I. It's a kind of Indian flatbread that's uh, really, really tasty. Um, And you uh, scoop up the, the curry and the rice with that roti. And then they also have a kind of hot sauce um, made with uh, tiger's tooth peppers and weary weary peppers. It's really good that I, I conned somebody. Well, it didn't con them. I, I got the recipe out of them for how to make it. So there's what it should look like. And now this is going to be set aside to... Um, just kind of chill out and what will happen over the next couple hours is that uh, those onions will lose a lot of their bite because they've got salt and uh, lime juice on them and then they'll get a, they'll get to be more liquid in this tuco de gallo so that's that's basically how I do it sometimes I'll add a little garlic in there but not very often there's there's plenty of things that you can add garlic to um, let's see from the Philippines uh, man, they've got some really good food, and they have this other thing that I've been trying to get for a long time, but you can't you can't get here, and it's called uh, palm wine, and that was the coolest thing I'm going to tell you about it. But what I need to do next is I'm going to start some refried beans. Now, what I like to do is I like to start with um, Whole pinto beans, and this really isn't difficult. So this is a pressure cooker, and see, I got some pintos over here, uh, measuring cup. Uh, this this makes enough beans for a couple meals. Although I'm a big ass bean eater, so a couple meals for me is probably a lot for you. Um, so I'm going to put a measuring cup full of beans in this pressure cooker. See? Measuring cup full of beans. And then, let's see, I'm going to seal my bag back up. And then I'm going to add some water, um, not a huge amount, but enough to cover the beans by an inch or two. And then that should uh, that should help us out. So back to this story on palm wine. Uh, when I went when I went over there, uh, most of my time I spent up um, in uh, Karigara. Um, but the the outfit that I went with, Team Rubicon, had a base of operations in uh, in Tacloban. And, um, but I, I wasn't there but like a day, and it was at the end of my particular time there. I think, I, I can't remember, I think it was like 10 days or something like that. But anyway, uh, so now um, we're going to turn the heat on. You don't want that too high, um, otherwise the beans will stick to the bottom of the pot. But eventually um, what's going to happen is this is going to start steaming and then this will start rocking and after that starts rocking we, we wait 25 minutes um, and that's how we'll know that our beans are going to be soft enough for the next step 
So anyway, back to this palm wine. Sorry I keep interrupting myself, but I got to keep cooking. Uh, so we have that, we have that. Oh, I'm going to make another kind of salsa. Where did I put my other? Okay, so this is a salsa. Uh, I promise I'm going to get back to the palm wine, but this is a salsa that um, you make with whole peel tomatoes um, that a lady uh, in Garden City, Kansas taught me. And Garden City, Kansas is uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's about a six or seven hour drive from Kansas City and about a six or seven hour drive from Garden City anywhere else. So it's literally the middle of nowhere. They have a lot of packing plants there. And uh, because of that, they have a really, uh, really large population of people from different countries. And uh, one of the countries that they have a lot of people from is Vietnam. So you can get fantastic Vietnamese food there, like uh, pho hoa and everything else. And it's like authentic in-country Vietnamese food. It's really good. And then uh, the other population... I mean, there are other ethnicities there, certainly, but um, there's a lot of Filipinos, so you can get good Filipino food. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, people from Mexico and other places uh, in, uh, you know, southern North America and then a bunch of people from South America. So I'm going to drain off a little bit of this tomato juice, and I'm going to use that to make Mexican rice later. So anyway, this lady uh, that lived there, um, gave me this recipe for salsa, and I hope you basically just have a blender and you put these whole peeled tomatoes in there like so. I hope I have another jalapeno. If not, I'm going to have to use some uh, pickled jalapenos. That would suck, because I like this with uh, either jalapeno or serrano peppers. Okay, so now I'm going to have to use jarred um, jalapenos, but that's not the end of the world. Oh, I hope I have them. curious. Usually I've got jalapenos flying out of my nose. Oh, they're there. So for this recipe, it's better if you can use uh, fresh jalapenos, but I ate them all up. And so these are um, just some pickled jalapeno slices. And I'm just going to dump, uh, oh, a healthy amount in there, not a lot. Um, uh, two, two finger grabs full. And then Another tablespoon or so of cilantro that I've washed off. I'm going to throw that in there. And then, let's see, more salt. Um, for this, um, it's better if you use like a, a teaspoon or two of salt in there. So, um, But you don't have to. You can, you can do this however you want. But I like it. I like the flavor when there's about two teaspoons of salt in there. Um, And then we're going to add a little bit of granulated onion and granulated garlic to that. 
and that should make it nice and tasty for us. Just a little bit, I mean, not a huge amount. Oh, like maybe half a teaspoon, about that much. Of the garlic and about the same amount of your, of your uh, onion powder here. So back to this palm wine, basically, the last night I was there, they brought in like a few jugs of palm wine, and you can, it's like a, one of those huge, like, like this big, um, like you get like Hawaiian punch or whatever in those huge jugs, and they uh, fill it up with palm wine, and it's like two bucks for a huge thing of that. And then uh, everybody's got a little cup, tiny cup, not a big cup, and then one person holds the jug, and you stand around in a circle, and the jug pourer will come around and pour a little bit of uh, this stuff into your cup, and then he keeps going around the circle, and then as soon as you refuse a drink of this palm wine, then you're the pourer. And uh, anyway, I thought that was kind of a neat ritual and way of doing things. Now I'm just going to blend this up so that... This is kind of a powerful blender, so you kind of got to be careful with it. Um, obviously, don't turn it on unless you or don't plug it in unless you're sure it's turned off. Um, let's see. So now we'll plug it in, and it's just a couple little pulses. It, you know, if you have a different blender, it may take longer, but. And that's it. That's uh, delicious homemade salsa. Now this has to sit for a while too. And I'm going to need this blender a little later once the uh, once the beans are done uh, pressure cooking for 25 minutes. Let me turn the heat up a little bit on those. So here's what you end up with. Um, you've probably had salsa like this in just about every Mexican restaurant you've ever been to. Um, this is it's pretty standard um, way of doing it, and it's pretty tasty too. So we will pour that off into a bowl. Let's see, where's a bowl? Find a suitable container for that. There we are. So I'm just gonna just gonna pour it into here and wash it out. Then I think I think I'll show you how to make the red rice. And it's the kind of rice you get like in just about every Mexican restaurant under the sun. Um, but surprisingly, it's fairly difficult to find a recipe for that or have somebody show you how to make it. And uh, Again, I learned this from another one of my friends in uh, Kansas City, and their family, I think, ran a bunch of different Mexican restaurants, but she showed me how to make it. <clears throat> Give me two seconds. Now I have a, a rice steamer here, um, but the way she actually showed me to make this was in a saucepan. Um, but I don't I don't like to go to the trouble of that because I think the rice steamer does a pretty darn good job of it. So I have some rice here. It's uh, basically just extra long grain rice. I'm gonna try to figure out what the uh, see one cup of rice, two cups of water. So I'm gonna pour out a cup of rice here, and I'm gonna add that to the steamer.
like so. Cup of rice. Now I know I need two cups of liquid. Um, but how does it turn out red? Well, I'm going to show you. Um, here we have a uh, measuring cup. I'm going to put this, uh, oh, this is, what, about a half a cup of the tomato juice that's left from the whole peeled tomatoes that I made our, uh, our salsa out of. So that's going to go in there. And now um, I'm going to add uh, just a just a touch of this granulated garlic, not very much. You don't you don't want to be power, overpowered. Maybe a quarter teaspoon, something like that. And then I'm going to add uh, a little bit of onion powder, like that. And I'm going to top this up to two cups. Of liquid, so I'm gonna I'm gonna add water until that's at two cups. Give it a little stir, and then into the steamer it goes. Uh, I'm not ready to eat this yet. Uh, I usually it probably takes a half an hour to do this in here, and then I let it sit for oh an hour or so, not an hour, um, like 10-15 minutes. But we're kind of a long ways away from eating, um, so I'm just going to set that there. The uh, reason I showed that is maybe someday one of my kids will want to know how I used to make this rice when they were growing up. So we don't need that in the way anymore. Ah, now you see? Let me make sure you can see this. i gotta, I got to double check this. Yeah, okay, you can see this. So see, this started... Uh, that top part, you see how it's rocking? So I'm going to turn the heat down just a little bit, and we're going to make a note that in 25 minutes, um, my pinto beans are going to be soft enough for the next step. And uh, I've been trying to figure out the recipe that Taco Tico uses for their uh, for their refried beans for oh god, at least at least 20 years, and I finally figured it out. And so um, this is how I like to do my refried beans, and I'll as we go along, you'll get the whole recipe. Um, all right, let's see. What should I make next? So I have the salsa. I have uh, well, I have two salsas. I'm working on the beans. I've got the rice done. Oh, I know what we need to do. Um, I need to chop up some. Onions and green pepper uh, for the uh, salt for the uh, for the fajitas. So while I'm doing this, uh, if you have any questions, uh, want to talk about anything, comments, whatever, uh, shoot. Okay, so uh, how do I have find time for all my interests being a surgeon and having kids? Well. Number one, I'm a, uh, a plastic surgeon, so that's a little bit different than being a, a general surgeon. Now, I'm board certified in general surgery, but uh, I don't practice it. I practice plastic surgery, uh, and the reason is uh, I'm actually fairly good at, at plastic surgery, and uh, it's a little bit less acuity, so... I get to have a little bit more of a controllable lifestyle. So yes, I'm a surgeon, but um, I'm not as busy as some surgeons are with uh, emergencies and things like that. Um, as far as having time for kids, obviously, um, I spend a lot of time with them, uh, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't, basically, I don't leave the house. <laughs> you know, so you you won't see me going out at night. Um, stuff like that. And then the other reason I have a lot of time is I wake up early in the morning. Today I woke up at four. Uh, and I, because I, I just don't need a lot of sleep. And then finally, I don't watch TV. And if you stop watching TV, you'd be surprised how much you can get done in your life. Um, and, uh, I'm a prime example. Like most of the time when I'm out in the knife shop, it's like in the middle of the night. Like 
like, you know, 3, 4 in the morning or whatever. Let's see. This goes into there. And these um, are going to be my fajita vegetables, the onions, and uh, I'm going to add some green pepper to that. And I just, basically all I do for that is I saute those in butter, and I'm not, I'm not ready to do that yet, so I won't show that. Uh, give me a second here. So I have, uh, I have a green pepper that I'm going to wash here. And I'm going to chop that up and put that in there. Um, this is the kind of fajita seasoning I like. Um, I had this when I lived in Texas, and it's, I've been a big fan of it ever since. It's uh, Fiesta, Fiesta brand fajita seasoning with tender tenderizer. You can see it there. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. That's how I have to get it now because I don't live in Texas anymore. probably won't use this whole green pepper again because I only really need enough of the, the fixings for my wife and I. My kids don't, don't really like this stuff. Uh, they'll eat the meat and they'll eat cheese and they'll like wrap it up in their tortilla. I guess I'm supposed to be happy with that and I don't want to pick a fight so I am. Uh, at least they're eating something. Other questions? What what can I answer for you? What kind of content do you want to see on the channel? Um, we did a live stream a while ago about uh, about like what you wanted to see and all that, uh, and I've I've been sticking to that pretty much. Uh, I made a video on a lawnmower blade knife. I've done a bunch of cooking stuff, stuff you can do outside, stuff you can do camping. Um, the other thing I have coming up is I still have half of that lawnmower blade left. I'm going to make a, a full tang parang out of that. So that should be fun. So I don't, I don't know, uh, who's still watching. I know there's a bunch of people watching, but how much of this you've seen. Basically, if you go back to the beginning of the video, we're making fajitas and I'm, I'm kind of showing you how I do it, all the steps, uh, how to make a couple different kinds of salsa, how to make refried beans. Speaking of which, we've got five minutes on the pressure cooker. Uh, I start with uh, dried pintos and do it that way. Um, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little bit more of this green pepper. And then we'll be done with it. So there will be our fajita vegetables. Um, what I'll do is I'll get a when it's when I'm closer to wanting to eat, I'll take a skillet and uh, melt some butter, and then throw these in there and just kind of saute them for a while. And I like to add a little bit of this uh, fajita seasoning to it. Uh, not not too much, so you, you don't want to overdo it. So uh, if you give me a minute, I'm going to come right back. Uh, what I need to do is let the dog out, and then we'll make our fajita meat. This is the key part, and it's really simple. You think it's difficult and that there's some, like, secret to it? There really isn't. Let's see, I'll ask a question here. I enjoyed a camping trip you took and showed off the cooking. I like the travel vids, uh, just you sharing your interests. Well, um...
you know, all of that's coming. Some, sometimes it's a little bit hard for me to film a travel vid, um, but I, I mean, I have countless hours of actual stuff filmed that I just haven't ever had time to put into an actual video format. Um, but I will, I will get it done. Um, I kind of want to do another, another trip here pretty soon. Um, in the fall, I like to camp better in the fall. I'm going to be right back, and then I'll show you how to do the meat. All right, I'm back. Um, before I get into the uh, the making of the fajita meat, I forgot. Tomorrow, I'm having fried chicken, and I've got a I've got a video on how to do this, but I've since changed my processes processes a little tiny bit, and I'm going to show you what I changed. So I, I do everything the same up to this point. And so, you know, I boil the chicken and then save the, save the broth. This will go into the freezer once it's cooled down enough. Uh, and then you boil it up to 170 degrees. You get it to this stage where you can cut it. I'll get rid of this. And then you just... Uh, Cut it into pieces. Um, we're not huge eat meat eaters, so I, I'll cut each of these breasts into like three. Because that's, honestly, that's a, more than a big enough portion for me. Um, and it's easier to butcher these like that when they've, when they've already been boiled. There we go. Like that. Like that. And then once I get these chopped up, now here's where the magic comes in. This is this is what I'm doing different, right? Um, I'm going to show you a secret top secret to fried chicken and then then you basically just follow on the other video you follow everything the same but here we are so I got my chicken in a bowl Give me a sec. next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take some hot sauce I like Frank's red hot but they're all probably about the same 
Um, Louisiana hot sauce is another good one to use for this. And I just give it a good sprinkle, not too much. A good sprinkle. sprinkle of parsley flakes about like this uh, just just sprinkle it in there you're just adding a little color right not too much then buttermilk what we're gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna pour enough buttermilk in here to kind of almost cover everything and then just kind of turn things around with my hands a little bit. Um, obviously washing your hands frequently while you're cooking is a very good idea. And I do. Um, so, and then uh, basically what you end up with is something that looks about like that. And a couple of times between now and when I want to fry this up, I'll go in and just turn the pieces over. Um, but I'm going to let this sit in this buttermilk overnight in the fridge. Uh, let that chill out a bit. And then tomorrow I'll fry it up uh, exactly the way I did the rest of the fried chicken video. So that, that little step of adding that buttermilk and that hot sauce makes it awesome. Let's see. RPV says this is awesome. Hey man, thanks. I see you over at the other channel a lot, and I really appreciate your subscription over there. Uh, we'll be we'll be doing some of that tonight as well. Um, anyway, that's uh, that's that. As this really doesn't have anything to do with fajitas, but I went out to the fridge and I saw it, and so now I now I'm done with that. I knew I had to do that at some point today. Be right back, and we'll do the fajita meat. A box just came from Land Vend from my wife. Uh, probably some like, I don't know what the hell she ordered, but anyway, I'm waiting for this garbage can to come. I want one of these uh, Wesco Push Boy garbage cans. I got a small red one for my office, and it's amazing, but I have one coming that's a fluorescent orange awesome one, and it's shaped like a bomb. Um, but it's not here yet, and I was hoping it would come today. Because when that comes, I'm just going to, like, salivate it over all the time. And it's weird. The only reason I even like these garbage cans is because I was watching videos on how to live stream, and this guy PewDiePie kept coming up. And uh, I'm not really into his stuff, but he has this awesome orange garbage can. It's a Westco... Push Boy Jr. And of course you can't get them because the guy has 55 million subscribers on YouTube. And so the entire world supply of those has been bought up for like the next 15 million years. Um, but I got a nice little red one of those and then I got a, a bright orange bomb can. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to get it. But instead we got lands in from my wife. So here's some beef. You don't have to use fancy stuff. 
it's fajitas. It's uh, and you, you know, in order for this to end up tender, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to slice it thin once once you've cooked it. Um, so I just buy cheap meat, except that this stuff really isn't cheap. Um, this stuff I get from uh, uh, some uh, from an anesthesiologist and a hand surgeon that I know. Um, so um, this is a little more expensive, but I have a whole freezer of this. Let's see. RPV asks, what's your favorite Cajun dish? The jambalaya from the video. Well, I love that jambalaya. Um, I, when I grew up eating that, it wasn't called jambalaya. It was called Spanish rice. Uh, and my mom made it a bunch of different ways over the years. But uh, this is the way that I like to make it from that video. Some some guy on Blade Forum said that it wasn't jambalaya, and I'm like, okay, well then, what is it? <laughs> if it's not jambalaya, what the fuck do you call it? Um, it's it's more typical of the way things were made in they make jambalaya in New Orleans. So you know, there's as many recipes for jambalaya as there are recipes for hamburgers. Um, so as you might imagine, everybody thinks that their way is the right way. Um, and I don't really care. I, I make it the way I like it, and I like to eat it. Um, I like jambalaya. I like uh, these, uh, I like, well, honestly, my favorite is uh, red beans and rice. And someday I'll do a video on that. I make this stuff called pickled pork, and I have a video on how to make pickled pork. Um, but lately, what I've been doing is, is putting that pickled pork in there. That's another New Orleans thing is to use pickled pork. Let me see if i got a pickled pork shop in here somewhere. I might have put them all out in the garage. Yeah, I did. Um, but anyway, pickled pork. I like mine with uh, a, a pickled pork chop in there. And, uh, you know, andouille sausage. Um, usually... In addition to the pickled pork, I'll throw a ham hock in there. I, I should do an update video on that um, at some point. Uh, so I, my favorite is red beans and rice. Uh, obviously, I like jambalaya, too, because that goes with a lot of stuff. Um, I like, uh, shit, anything Cajun. I like um, blackened chicken. I like blackened fish. You know, you name it. I like... Uh, I mean, I love, I love all their food. I mean, you really can't go wrong. I've eaten all kinds of stuff down in the world. Now, if this wasn't a big raw bone, I'd probably give it to my dog. But I know if I gave it to her, she'd throw up. So I'm going to give this to the crows uh, across the road. Um, so I have some... I, I've taken this meat and I've, I've chopped it up into chunks like this. Like that. And these are going to go on the grill... They're going to be grilled until they're basically done. And then what you do, um, I'll, I'll demonstrate just slicing a little fat off here. But the, the way you have this end up tender is you, you slice it kind of thin, like so. So imagine that that was the heat of meat. I, I take it after it's cooked, and then I slice it up thin, and then I end up with a, with a nice, um, nice product. Uh, I like to add mesquite chips to this uh, as it's growing. Uh, I think the mesquite adds a real nice, uh, real nice um, flavor. And, and that trick um, came from a friend of mine that's uh, uh, from Texas. Actually, was a cowboy, um, real one. I mean, they don't do the drives anymore, but he works on the ranch. Um, so let's see, there's this one thing, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but the guy took like, uh, chicken breast and flattened it out real flat and then wrapped it around sausage with like a bunch of other stuff in there. I'll have to look that up. That, that's another fantastic, uh, Cajun thing. Uh, and then, I don't know. Really, you, you can't go wrong in my book. So this is something, this big thing of fat, like I'm not going to eat that. Um, what I'm going to do is 
I'll grill it and it'll keep everything moist, but then at the end, I'll just cut away the meat and give the fat to the dog or whatever. So, we have our meat cut up. We need to get a bowl. So, I have a big bowl, probably too big for this application, but I take the meat. And uh, Yosemite Sam says, I love the sound of a pressure cooker. Hey, thanks for reminding me. I've got another 5-10 minutes left on those beans. I put the meat in the bowl. Not not complicated. Wash my hands. Because I'm done touching meat now. I swear, like half the time I'm cooking, I, I spend washing my hands. Um, but now, you know, we got meat. Like I was saying earlier, this is uh, this is uh, Fiesta brand extra fancy fajita seasoning. I got turned on to this when I lived in Texas. And I just sprinkle a healthy amount over this. And then... Now this is where it gets really complicated, right? And I've got some olive oil, and I sprinkle some of that over. Not a bunch. I mean, there's no exact recipe here. You're just you're just making a liquid for it. And then lime juice. That's it. That's literally all you have to do and your fajitas will be awesome. And then, like I said, I grill them with a little mesquite wood. Uh, every once in a while I'll turn these over or something like that. Uh, it looks like about five minutes left on the pressure cooker. Maybe a little less. So, lime juice. So you've got acid and oil and salt and whatever else is in that fajita seasoning. And then I'll uh, kind of give it a toss. And then this will go in the fridge and sit. I'm probably going to grill these up in about two and a half, three hours. And that's plenty of time for this to marinate. Um, and the next step here is for me to get rid of this uh, cutting board and that knife because it's all contaminated. Uh, because I want to make one more thing before I make the beans, and that is guacamole. Space is decontaminated. All the bad stuff is out of there. So, on the cutting board, fresh, hasn't been used. This is a very difficult, high-intensity recipe, secret recipe. You take your avocado, and I just slice it around like so, and don't cut myself. And you open it up, and when you pick an avocado up at the store, it should be like a little bit mushy. That's how you know you'll be able to mash it, and how you know it's ready. And then... 
going to grab another bowl here. Here we go. Got a bowl. We're just going to peel this avocado. Give me a minute. Goes in the bowl. I'm gonna take the pit out and peel the other half. There we go. We'll wash the hands. Now, very, very complicated recipe. Lime, half a lime, right? That's it. Squeeze the juice, and you don't need a whole lot, but I, I kind of like mine a little bit mushier, so I'm going to squeeze a whole half a lime juice in there for that one avocado. I'll save this for later. And then... So I'm going to start with a teaspoon and then we'll taste it and see. And now we just mash her up. Try not to get a bunch of stuff all over the place. It, this works a little better if you have a bigger bowl. Give me a minute. I'm going to get a bigger bowl. Work on that. Here we are. I thought these were going to be a little softer than they were, and they ended up being um, based on how they felt. Even when I was feeling them. So we got this high-tech device here. We will mash this up. There we go. And uh, just mash it up real good. Any questions while I'm doing this? Comments? Other stuff you'd like to see? You're about to see this world world premiere of how to make taco tico blue fry beans. I spent 20 years figuring this out. need any more salt than that. That's plenty. Might squeeze in just a little bit more lime juice. Um, that'll that'll hopefully keep this from turning brown. Then I have this uh, bowl that I originally started with. I'm just going to give this one more stir. And we'll put this down in the bowl. Then I'm going to cover it up and put it in the fridge. But that's uh, that's all there is to guacamole. It's not it's not a, a fancy dish. It doesn't have to be anyway. Some people add you know all kinds of stuff in there, and sometimes I do too, depending on what mood I'm in. But most of the time, I just like a plain old avocado, lime, and salt. Damn good.
So I have a little saran wrap and we'll, we'll cover this up and try to just keep air away from it. Um, but the lime, lime juice should protect it until it's ready to eat. But it can never be too, too safe. So there we go. There, see, I just I just push push it down over the top of the guacamole to, to just seal it up a bit. I'll put that in the fridge. Let's see. Do you use rhubarb for pie much or mainly jam? Actually, um, I will do a strawberry rhubarb pie occasionally. Um, mainly what I use the rhubarb for is rhubarb crisp, which actually works fantastically well in a Dutch oven. Uh, it's an old family recipe, oh, dating back well over a hundred years, um, and I I like that a lot. So that's I'd say the majority of my rhubarb goes into rhubarb crisp. Now those beans are definitely done, so I'm going to turn the heat off, and I'm going to do something you probably shouldn't do, which is I'm going to run that under cool water. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to clean up a couple things in the kitchen here. Give me about give me about three minutes, and I'm going to I'm going to make some beans here for you. Got to have a drink of water here. But that rhubarb jam recipe, it actually works. Like I've been doing it this way forever, and that jam that I made in that video is going to be gone in no time because as soon as people figure out that I have this. It's like, bam. Um, I, I don't like to give people advice on canning um, because I worry that if I give advice out and somebody gets sick or something that they're going to blame me. So um, just, just consider that recipe a fresh recipe, meaning whatever you make, use it that day. Um, and there you have it. I, I just get really nervous giving people advice on how to preserve food um, because botulism is no joke. I'm going to put some stuff in the fridge, uh, do a little bit of work here, and I will resume cooking in about two or three minutes. Actually, I have to give these this bone to the crows too. That will take me just a minute. I'll be back.
cool these beams down here. Uh, let's see. Our PV says a dedicated vid for rhubarb crisp would be sweet. I usually just do rhubarb pie, no strawberries, because I don't want to adulterate the rhubarb flavor. Well, that's that's definitely a good point. Um, I forgot to tell you, and I'll see if I have any in my fridge here. And it looks like I don't because I ate it all. The other thing I do is I make uh, rhubarb sauce, which is basically just rhubarb and sugar. And you heat it up like you would for jam, only you don't get it quite as hot or as thick. And so I do a lot of that. I will make a video on how to do the rhubarb crisp in a Dutch oven uh, before, before too long here. I've, I've got rhubarb coming out of my ears right now. It's, it's in the winter months where I'm going to suffer. Because I, I put up, I want to say I put up 60 cups this year, which is which is which sounds like a lot, but if you eat as much rhubarb as I do, that's hardly anything. All right, I'm going to cool down this pressure cooker. So now we have our beans that we've cooked, and there's a bunch of liquid in there. This next step, I pour off just a little bit of the liquid, not very much of it. You can't see what I'm doing here, but just trust me. And then all of this goes into the blender, like so. Now, it's actually fairly dangerous to blend a hot liquid, um, so I'm going to do something something here. Jeff uh, Joseph says, hey man, I wanted to say I appreciate everything you do. Your videos are great, and we're fortunate enough to have them. Thank you so much. Hey man, love that you're watching uh, and that you took the time out of your day to comment and um, hope you uh, hope you keep enjoying the content. If you really, really, really want to do me a favor, subscribe to the uh, Average Iowa Guy live streams um, channel. There's a link in the description here, and uh, I, that I, I really want to get that up to 100 subscribers because that's where I'm pushing the uh, Knife Journal podcast to. And if I can get it to 100 subscribers and then a bunch of video views, I can unlock some features. And then if I get it to a thousand, I can un unlock some even more badass stuff. But one step at a time. One step at a time. I'd be happy with a hundred right now. I think the last time I checked was earlier today. It was at 82, and I uh, I put it at <laughs> I put a, a video of me, a live stream of me making sauerkraut on my Facebook page. And I told them if they didn't uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel that I was going to live stream sauerkraut 24 hours a day, seven days a week until I had a, <laughs> uh, a uh, enough subscribers. I'm going to show you. I gotta, you got to see this sauerkraut. You're going to shit yourself. Oh, my God, that's heavy. So this is the amount of sauerkraut that I think a human should consume in a few months. Well, this will last me till Christmas. Um, it's, uh, I think I ended up with seven kilograms of kraut in there. But anyway, I threatened them. I told them I was going to dominate their news feed with just a camera sitting on this 24 hours a day and it starts bubbling. So instead, when they logged on, instead of getting cat videos, they were going to get bubbling sauerkraut. And if I don't make it to 100 subscribers by tomorrow morning, I'm going to I'm going to do another one of these live streams and put it on this channel. Only it's just going to be a camera focused on that <laughs> with an explanation that I'm not taking it down <laughs> until I get 100 subscribers. Hashtag sauerkraut ransom. So. Um, 
I've done sauerkraut in a crock. If you give me a second, I'll show you the crock that I used to do it in. Actually, it's out in the garage. I don't want to mess with it. But anyway, it's one of these old kraut crocks, the big stoneware crocks. And uh, I did it in there for the longest time, but I just got sick of dealing with um, mold and every once in a while some fruit flies would try to get in there. And I just don't want to deal with that shit. So now I do it in that big jar. And that little thing at the top was an airlock. And that airlock uh, keeps um, yeast out and buggies out and lets the CO2 um, out so that your bacteria has a chance to grow and do it, its thing and not get a yeasty flavor in your kraut. I don't like that flavor in my kraut. I like a pure tasting kraut. And to do that, you have to use an airlock. Um, at least that's the only way I've figured out how to do it reliably. Um, so there's that. Now, so here's my beans that I've pressure cooked uh, in a blender. Now I'm telling you that it's very dangerous to blend up a hot liquid. So I have a trick um, that should theoretically keep me safe. Um, so here's my blender. This is a very powerful blender. You do not dare plug this in until you are sure both switches are off. And then uh, you put this back up on top of there. Then before you do anything, you just drape this over the top. So if anything splashes out of there, it's going to splash into this rag and not into my face or on my bare baby arms. Don't ask me how I know that. Don't ask me how I know about cooking burns, so I'm a fiend about that. And that's it. That's all she wrote. And I'm going to put the blender base away, and I'll show you the next step here. Uh, I'm revealing the world-famous Taco Tico refried beans today. It took me 20 years to figure this out. Is this stinking? Every once in a while on these blenders, you got to watch because if this, um, there's some grease in here, and every once in a while you have to replace the bottom um, housing there, like every couple of years or something. But you want to keep an eye on that because eventually what happens is the, um, the bearings or whatever go bad, and you have to replace that. Um, otherwise, it it'll it'll burn up. You know, it'll burn everything up. So I just I just check that every every time I think of it. Okay, now we're in for some excitement on the stove top. I'm gonna turn up the uh, fan a little bit, but you'll still be able to hear. Uh, I'm put on some. Some heat here. Come on, there it goes. And then uh, that one looks anemic. That one, yeah, they're both maybe. I, anyway, I'll put that there. Let that warm up for a minute. Now I'm going to show you. I'm going to just lay out the ingredients right here in front of the camera. Let me make sure you can still see what's going on here. Yeah, you can see it. So. I'm going to put uh, what goes in there right here. So I got a little granulated garlic. Taco Tico is, is white people Mexican food. It was like the first ever Mexican chain that showed up in my hometown in the middle of Iowa. Nobody knew what the hell it was. but Because uh, like literally up until like, up until really recently in my hometown, you couldn't buy like cilantro in the store. So that, that just goes to tell you. You know, they're, how uh, culinary limiting that can, <laughs> culinarily limiting that can be. Um, let's see. So, two other ingredients, a little bit of onion powder. Again, 
think bland. Okay, bland. A little bit of ground cumin. Think bland. And then the secret ingredient that gives it that wonderful tang is just a little bit of vinegar. So once our pan gets hot, oh, the other thing is, is uh, refried beans are refried because you, you cook the beans first and then you put them into a, uh, you cook them again um, with some oil or fat. Now, uh, a big mistake you can make is using too flavorful of a fat. So bacon grease, no, unless you want bacon beans. Um, any any kind of a any fat that you add into this, if it has any kind of a flavor, it's, your beans are going to taste like that because these are very very bland by themselves. We're going to add in some spices and of course a little salt. The salt um, is to taste. There's not a great measurement for that. Uh, but uh, be real careful what kind of fat you add to this. Um, you know, the, the traditional thing is to use lard. I don't have any lard. Uh, and most of the time what I add to this, once we get a little bit warmer here, oh, also, you have one of these, like a cooking screen to put over the top of that after you dump this stuff in. Your, your uh, significant other is really going to thank you because you're not going to mess up the kitchen. So don't forget that part. So for fat, I'm going to use a really neutral tasting oil. So the, the, most, uh, the most neutral thing I have right now is the safflower oil. Um, and with this, uh, I also make mayonnaise. It makes great mayonnaise. See, I think we're hot enough. I'm going to turn it down just a little bit. I don't want it to go too crazy. I'm going to just put a, a couple tablespoons of this in the bottom of there. Not too much. We're not making fat, we're making beans. Now we'll take this. We're going to have our screen ready. And I'm going to dump it in there. Like so. See that? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace that screen. So that was a that was a cup of pinto beans and the liquid. Now I'm just going to take like a, a tablespoon or so, not a tablespoon, what am I thinking, a teaspoon or so of uh, ground cumin. Maybe a little bit more than that. Not too much. Think, think bland. You, you just want a hint of the taste in there. And a, a, probably a half a teaspoon of garlic, granulated garlic. And I'll put a, uh, a half a teaspoon of, uh, well, maybe more, maybe a full teaspoon of granulated onion in there. There we go. And I'm going to put just a tiny bit of pepper, like a quarter teaspoon of that in there. Think bland. Think white people living in Iowa with no exposure to anything, but they love this shit, and I love it. And I'm going to start with about a, oh, for that amount, about a, a good teaspoon of salt. We'll have to taste it at the end to make sure we're doing well. And then your vinegar. I'm going to add in, oh, there's a good teaspoon Another good teaspoon. And what that does is just adds this tangy flavor. It's really, really good. Now we just stir it a little bit. And we're going to cook this until it uh, thickens up a bit. I'm being sure not to burn our beans on the bottom. Uh, once this reduces a bit, then we'll, we'll, we'll taste it to see if, if it's uh, got the right amount of salt. If you start with a teaspoon, you're probably going to have to add more, but um, you know you don't want these to be overpowering. You want them to be subtle. You want them to have subtle flavor and not um, not knock your socks off. Um, uh, 
one thing that taught me about that is having kids. So if you have kids and you cook for kids, uh, you really have to be careful um, about seasonings and things because their taste buds haven't been completely blown out. Now here's the pico de gallo that we made earlier. Let me, let me make sure you can see this. Yeah, you can see it. So there's the pico de gallo. Um, it's developing its own liquid here. And this is probably ready. Um, I could put it in the fridge now. Let's check on our other salsa. This is that uh, Garden City salsa that we showed earlier. We have some fajita vegetables that I will saute in butter later. We've made our meat. Uh, we made some guacamole. We made uh, red rice, which is fantastic. Um, that's the way to do red rice, um, in Mexican style red rice. Um, different parts of the world have different types of rice, but for Mexico, that's my favorite recipe. <clears throat> so basically all I got to do now, we just cooked a fajita dinner. I'll still have to grill the meat. <coughs> Again, I said I like mesquite on there. I'll have to slice that up, warm up some tortillas in the microwave, maybe put out some um, shredded cheese or something, and then uh, go to town. It's a fiesta feed. I'll uh, take a couple minutes here and then answer any more questions that come in. If not, that's cool. I hope you enjoyed cooking with me because I enjoyed talking to you while I was cooking. Otherwise, I was just going to sit here and listen to music or uh, be bored. Um, usually when I'm cooking, I listen to a book on tape. Uh, or something like that. Any any questions, uh, anything you want to see on the channel, uh, comments, etc. Uh, shoot now or forever hold your peace. I'm going to give it another minute or so. Got to start putting away my stuff or I'll get in trouble. Let's see. RPV says, what are some good books you've been listening to lately? Okay, so there's this author named uh, Stieg Larsson from Sweden, and I'm listening through the trilogy of uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, the other thing I listen to whenever a new one comes out is I listen to the Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Podcast, and he's got all, all kinds of old episodes of that. Um most of, well, a lot of it is still available on iTunes for free, or you can go to his site and down, pay to download. Um, they, it's fantastic. And if, if there's one you would start with uh, to kind of get a flavor of what it's like, it's kind of short um, and it's really good. I would say um, start with the one um, set in Germany. It is, uh, uh, let me... I need to look that up real quick, but uh, basically, give me two seconds and I'll give you the title.
okay, I have an answer. So the one to start with is, uh, well, that I think is still available is called Prophets of Doom. Uh, Prophets of Doom was about the time, uh, so I have a, a somewhat confused uh, religious background because of switching schools and things like this. Um, but uh, Prophets of Doom was about the time when uh, Martin Luther was going around doing the Reformation on the uh, Catholic Church. And it, as it turns out, there were a whole bunch of other groups at that time that were doing that. And some of them were a little more radical than others, to put it lightly. Well, um, Prophets of Doom is about uh, this town in Germany that got basically taken over by this uh, reforming sect uh, that uh, basically took the town over and... Um, the uh, powers that be got pissed off, and so they sieged the town, and all kinds of mayhem ensued. Uh, I'll let you listen to it. It's it's fabulous. I just love it. Let's see. What YouTube channels do you follow? Okay. Um, let's see. I watch on YouTube. Most of what I watch is I'm looking for information on a specific subject, and I'll look it up. Um uh, I watch some, uh, right now, let's see, what else do I watch? I watch uh, a bunch of different um, political discussions I, I from all over the map. So on the left, I will occasionally tune in to watch uh, the Young Turks. And on the right, I watch people like uh, uh, Louder with Crowder and then a, a classical liberal that I watch. Um, and by classical liberal, I mean somebody that's, more like me that's like uh, I don't care what you do it's none of my freaking business but uh, uh, what I would say is uh, do what you want to do but don't pick my wallet on the way out the door and don't do it to me and and that's the Sargon of a, car, a cod guy so I watch political stuff but I like to know what everybody is saying not just one particular side so those are three of those that I watch then uh, let's see, who else do I watch? Those are ones I would say on the most consistent basis um, that I check in on to see what they're up to. Occasionally I will watch the Joe Rogan podcast on YouTube. He has a guest that I'm interested in, but not all of it. Um, another one, what else? Um... Um, anyway, those are, those are the political ones. And then, like I said, uh, um, I do all kinds of other channels if I'm looking at a, uh, looking at a particular thing, looking up a particular subject, like if I'm, oh, I know one. Um, uh, I like this guy from Philadelphia. He's a cooking guy is like, his name's like Philly boy J cooking or something like that. And then he's got like the Philly boy J cooking 2.0 that I like. Uh, and then there's a guy from New Orleans that I like to watch, uh, cook. Gosh, I'll have to put a link to his, um, channel in my description here. I really like that guy. He, he makes fantastic stuff and he makes it from scratch. He seems like a real nice guy. Um, so those are, that's a good place to start. And the list changes all the time. I think somebody asked this last time, and it hasn't changed much since then. Uh, oh, another cooking one I like to watch is uh, Cooking in Russia. But I don't think he's making any active videos. And then just randomly, I will log on and watch uh, Russian dash cam. If I want to be entertained, if I have like a couple minutes and I'm waiting to do something else and I just want to zone out. I watch the Russian dash cam stuff. I can't look away. I freaking love it. So let's see, probably one more comment here. Tom Sortolini says, Hey, just wanted to say thanks for the great content you provide. You're an inspiration. Hey man, that makes me feel good. Greetings from Norway. Say hi to James as well. I sure will. Um, I have lots of relatives from Norway. Actually, Holland and Norway. Okay, so these beans are actually 
beans are actually done. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring them a little closer to kind of show you the consistency. Um, the mistake that people make when they're making refried beans, I'm going to set this down. This is a, a wet uh, thing, and I'm only going to have it here for a minute, so this should be okay. Um, the mistake that people make when they're making refried beans is they cook them too long and they get too thick. And then, then you have like this pasty, nasty shit. And I don't like that. So this is about the consistency you want. When you scrape your, let me just make sure you can see this real well. When you scrape your spatula through the bottom, um, yeah, you can see this. So when you scrape your spatula through the bottom, it should leave like a little streak like that. And that's, these are plenty done. Because I'm not going to eat these for a bit. I'm going to let them set up. And when I reheat these, what I like to do is I like to put them in a, a baking dish and reheat them in the oven. Now let me make sure that the salt is good here. Plenty salty. Plenty, plenty much flavor. Basically, if you're starting with a cup of dried um, beans, basically what I showed you was going to make some damn good beans just about every time. Mmm, beans. I'm a big bean guy. Love beans. Love rice. Oh, uh, that's it. So, uh, hey man, uh, hey ladies, gentlemen, everybody who's watching this, uh, thanks so much for watching. Uh, we cooked some fajitas. Good stuff. Um, got nothing else to say. Once again, thanks for watching. If you really want to do me a favor, head over to the... Uh, the uh, Average Iowa Guy live streams channel. There's a link in the description and hit me up with a subscription. That will, you don't even have to watch it. I don't care, but it, it, if I get my subscriber count up, it helps me unlock some extra features. So thanks.